Uh, yes, on to Mr. True, please, for up to five minutes. Okay, <clears throat> thanks very much uh, to the Chair and the Committee for the invitation to be here. Um, to, to be honest, I wasn't exactly sure how to frame um, my presentation on the topic of non-tariff barriers. It seemed to me quite a broad category. I thought maybe uh, given the high profile of certain food issues around non-tariff barriers, that would be the focus. But you know, from looking at the group you have here, it's more eclectic and more varied than that. So I, I decided to keep it kind of big picture and just mention three things I think it's important to keep in mind in any discussion about um, non-tariff barriers. So um, the first is that what one group, whether say a producer group or maybe a trade economist, for example, what one group considers uh, a non-tariff barrier, other groups might call simply good public policy, right? And I'll give you a few, a few examples. Front of package uh, health labeling, for example, on cigarettes, alcohol, or food, maybe talking about the co uh, sugar or fat content, for example, that apply to domestic as well as international companies. Um, you could have labels that have to do with other reasons as well, like halal labeling in Indonesia, for example. Um, that's come up as both a technical barrier to trade and as in, in that country in particular, say, a good public policy. You know, another example, California's animal welfare laws, expanding minimum cage and pen sizes for captive uh, farm animals and banning the sale of food products, uh, even from out of state that uh, can't meet those standards. There's policies aimed at reducing the use of pesticides, for example, or favoring organics. Uh, based on environmental c considerations or uh, the preferences of a given local, national, or perhaps regional population in the case of the European Union. And maybe public stockholding, and there's tons of other examples, but public stockholding programs in, say, India um, that uh, aim to stabilize prices and, and, uh, and compensate struggling farmers. So all of these are clear cases of public health, public... Um, they serve public health, public ethics, social or environmental purposes, but they may also be challenged uh, in trade deals with overly strict rules on, on how governments are allowed to regulate. Um, the second point I'll make is that existing trade deals, I think, go far enough and probably too far to limit regulatory and policy space in ways that impoverish uh, our democracy and the democracies in other countries. Um, Canada and the U.S. are among the rel a relatively small group of countries at the WTO who continue to expand disciplines on government regulatory space in their bilateral and uh, regional trade agreements. I think the COSMA is the most striking example of this, and, and I can share um, some of the research I've done uh, previous uh, on, on some of the ways in that, the ways that that's true, uh, if the committee is interested. Um, the agreement goes further, for example, than most trade deals um, to kind of privilege the interests of foreign investors and foreign companies in the domestic rulemaking process, uh, and it enshrines in international law a single allegedly best way to regulate in all instances in what they call a good regulatory practice chapter, which is open to dispute settlement in that agreement. Um, the amount of work that Canadian regulators now already do to ensure public protections comply with our trade obligations, comply with things like Red Tape Reduction uh, Act rules and regulatory burden assessments, that's been described um, by, by different groups as creating red tape for regulators. It actually gets in the way of governments doing their job in some cases, which is, which is regulating to protect uh, public interests. Um, that job, I would say, is complicated enough by today's uh, overlapping and very serious environmental and social problems. And in some areas, like fossil fuel emissions or biodiversity loss or online privacy, for example, I think governments are under pressure to do more to restrict trade um, and, and to actually create what might be considered as trade barriers or technical barriers to trade, uh, and for good reasons, uh, to rapidly lower greenhouse gas emissions, uh, to protect, again, public privacy by limiting cross-border flows of data, for example. These are all examples, again, of where public policy could be framed one way or the other. Um, the final thing I'll say is that I believe there are already appropriate venues uh, exist uh, in, in Canada's WTO, uh, at the WTO, excuse me, and, and in our bilateral agreements for addressing differences with other countries with respect to technical barriers to trade, food standards, and uh, other policies. Um, the notice system at the WTO is actually quite effective at, at diffusing problems before they end up before a dispute settlement panel. Um, and, you know, where, where, where we have bilateral commitments and committees established to look at specific issues, as in CETA, um, it's not obviously what a lot of producers' uh, groups would say is a perfect solution, but I would say it's one that strikes a good balance between the democratic obligations of governments to their people and varied interests in how they develop po policy on the one hand and the trade interests of limited groups on the other. So I'll just, I'll just conclude there to say that I think this is a possibly huge area of study for the committee, and I, I wish you good luck in, in grappling with it. I think it's an important area as well, because it cuts to the heart uh, 
of what our trade agreements do uh, and what they could be doing better in this, in this era's, era as we grapple with these very big problems like climate change, biodiversity loss, for example. So thank, thank you Thank you very much.